Hey, it's John Bear. So happy to see your beautiful face and welcome to this Q&A video with my dad, the geologist Oliver Inkolfsson. Welcome, Oliver. Thank you very much. Thank you. And today our intention is to do a bit of a Q&A video because we've gotten a lot of questions in the comments. I thought it would be a nice idea to answer these questions on camera and so more of you can see the answers and, you know, Hopefully we can have a good time while we're at it. So how are you doing? You're in the cabin right now. Yes, I'm in the cabin in the, at the fringe of the highlands in Western Iceland. Wonderful. It's uh, raining and windy and uh, a good <laughs> time to spend in the cabin. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, rainy and windy sounds very Iceland. <laughs> uh, for me right. right now, I'm in Dubai. Um, it's sunny, always sunny and almost too sunny. <laughs> It's so hot outside that I barely go outside. Speaking of hot things, let's jump into these questions about this uh, volcano. Everybody has burning questions that need answering. Well, I'll try and answer the best I can, just to emphasize that I'm kind of writing on the back of my colleagues um, at the University of Iceland. There's a very good team of geologists, geochemists, volcanologists, remote sensing specialists, and they have been monitoring the uh, eruption hour by hour, basically, for the past four months. And they are, have freely shared their data with me and everybody else. So I hope I will give correct answers to the questions. If I get something wrong, that's me, not my colleagues, just to make this clear from the beginning. The Earth Science Institute has a very good web page where they post all the latest information. Mm. We might be able to give that uh, link uh, by the end of the video. Uh, it's nice that you give credit where credit is due. Obviously, we are relying on all the hard work from all the professionals that are hanging out, recording all this data for us. Uh, you yourself, uh, you're a, you teach geology, uh, but your main specialty is uh, glacial geology, correct? Yeah, absolutely. It's glacial geology, quaternary geology. It's basically environmental changes over the past uh, um, two, three million years, and mm -hmm. volcanism is certainly a part of that, mm -hmm. and the volcanic history. So I follow this eruption, of course, with a keen interest. It feeds into what I'm doing, although I'm not a specialist in volcanology at all. There is an overwhelming amount of people who are just saying thank you for being able to explain a lot of these things in um, sort of layman's terms. A lot of people expressed that you were very clear, even a child could understand what you were talking about. So I think you have a good skill set for explaining these things. I'm very happy to hear that. And uh, well, th this is the thing about geology. Geology is not very complicated, really. It's, uh, there are a certain set of processes that, that operate and the results of these processes are a certain set of products. And basically what geology does is that it it monitors, it uh, records, and it makes interpretations. And the present is the key to the past, and the past is the key to the future. It's a little bit what we do as geologists. We try to understand environmental changes that are ongoing, use our understanding of those to interpret the geological record, and in some cases make some predictions. And from this sense, it's very important that we monitor this uh, volcanic eruption very closely. It's a Every volcanic eruption is unique, and this is a unique uh, uh, eruption. We haven't observed volcanic eruptions in this area, uh, well, over the past 800 plus years. And of course, this is everything that's happening there is, in a sense, new to us geologists. But we, we try to learn from it and uh, we use that understanding to get a better idea about how this volcanic system do um, behave and how they might behave in the future. That's also very important. Mm -hmm. the, the history of the earth and the history in the making. Geological history in the making, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, I'm just going to jump right into the first question here. Phil Box says, yes, please, more dad, the geologist. Would be awesome if he could explain the separation of the gases from the molten rock within the earth to form those massive jets exiting the volcano. The role the cool lava plays form a more or less insulating layer over the hot rocks and the lava within the field after it flowed across the landscape. Totally fascinating talk from Dad, the geologist. 
more, more. The, the magma that's uh, being fed to the surface in Celtic Adara is coming from very deep. It's, uh, now my colleagues say it's at least 17, 17 kilometers. And it's not coming from a magma chamber. It's coming more or less from pockets or, 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 or places of molten rock at this depth, uh, basically at the contact between the Earth's crust and the, the, the mantle that's below the crust. Down there, it's, there's enormous pressure. And as the magma starts to travel towards the surface, volcanic gases that are basically a part of the magma, they are, they are kind of in the solution, if you like. Uh, once the magma comes nearer to the surface, the pressure, surrounding pressure falls, and these gases, they start to uh, free themselves from the magma. And they form bubbles, gas bubbles. It's the same process as you can see, basically, in a, if you take a bottle of soda with carbon dioxide, you shake mm. the bottle of soda and you build up pressure. And then you open up the soda bottle and it sprouts all over the room. It's pretty much the same process, really. Once the, the magma is very close to the surface, we think that below the crater, or in the connection with the crater, there is a chamber or a kettle or a cauldron, if you like, where the gases can free themselves from the magma. And these gas bubbles, then huge gas bubble, they rise up and up into the crater where there's a pool of, of lava. Mm. And once they reach that pool of lava, they kind of make it sprout, making these lava fountains. Right, right. These lava curtains which sprout up in the air. And one part of the eruption... Uh, starting about a month after the eruption started. This was a very prominent process. And, you know, we were there and filmed it. We, these lava fountains would sprout up 100 meters into the air um, at fairly regular intervals. But this has been changing in the course of the eruption. It has to do with a number of things. It has to do with the pressure. It has to do with the temperature. It has to do with the architecture or or configuration of the feeding pipe and this cauldron below the crater, this effusive activity, as we call it, with gases release, releasing big bubbles and throwing up lava in the air. They have been varying a lot, and mm. they are not very prominent right now. They haven't been for the last month or so. Right. So the interval the for spewing is, is it's more dormant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so most of the degassing of the lava actually happens during this process. Mm. Most of the degassing has happened already before the, the, the lava starts to stream out of the crater. Yeah. But of course, there is an element of degassing occurring as long as the lava is molten, but it's, it's, a, it's relatively minor degassing from the flowing lava. There was a second... Um, Part of this question about what happens when the when the lava flow crusts over. Yeah. The lava is maybe 1100 degrees Celsius when it leaves the crater. But once it gets in contact with the uh, atmosphere, with rain and wind and w whatever, the surface of the lava cools fairly quickly and it, it crusts. It, 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 it makes a crust and this crust may be anything from a few centimeters to a few decimeters thick, but the lava continues to flow below this crust. But this crust is incredibly efficient in isolating the, the, the molten lava so that the lava can flow one kilometer or two kilometers and it only cool by a few degrees below this crust. So this crust is very efficient in insulating. So the lava, we, we see that the lava has been flowing quite long distances below this crust. So we don't really see the lava flowing anywhere, but still um, the lava front is advancing. And also what happens is that the whole lava pile, if you like, kind of inflates because below the crust lava is still being pumped into the molten body that is below the surface. Mm. So the lava, the surface of the lava flows kind of increasing by maybe a meter per day in some instances. And that's because the volume of the lava below this solid crust is increasing. Mm. So the whole sort of carpet 
over it. It's just raising as the volume inside increases. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Great. We'll jump into the next question. Um, Chris Navin asks, when you have the full moon coming up at the end of the month, will it affect the volcano like it affects the tides in the ocean? With the change of gravity, will it make the volcano more fierce? Interesting question. That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, the thing is that the moon, the gravity between the Earth and the moon doesn't only affect the, the oceans, it also affects land. Mm. So yeah. there is a kind of a tidal wave going through the land, affecting it. But I don't think that we see any measurable changes in the rhythm of the eruption as a result of this. Mm. The intensity of the eruption varies quite a lot. Mm. And there have been periods with very little activity. There have been periods with very, very high activity. Or very, I don't think we can connect that to the moon at all. all right. But we, we cannot exclude that the moon has some effect. But mm. it's probably too small for us to measure or to be noticeable. Cool. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Then I'll jump into the next one. Uh, Chris Ackerley. Oh, he starts by saying, your dad is a tough old bugger. I have a question for him. Assuming it's trapped gas that causes the magma to shoot up like that, what kind of pressure does it take to cause molten rock to shoot up 300 meters? I've wondered for a while, but nobody answered this question. I guess you can make these calculations uh, and based on the density of the gas, based on the density on the, of the lava pool, but what it all really boils down to is the size of the gas bubbles that are coming from the cauldron into the magma pool or lava pool, which is in the crater. These highest um, fountains of, of lava that were thrown in the air, they, they were actually measured on occasion to reach uh, a couple of hundred meters or maybe even 300 meters. So we know that the, 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 the gases can do this. Mm. And then it's probably a question of uh, an exceptionally large and rapid release of gases in the cauldron that's below the pool of lava, mm. which is in the crater. We know it happened. And I'm sure the physicists, they can calculate the, the, the exact, forces behind this. But, yeah. but this is something that we measured. Yeah. And uh, that's good enough for me. I hope it's good <laughs> enough for the guy who asked the question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can't give you the exact numbers of the, the pressure, the amount of pressure required. But um, I'm, I'm guessing some physicist or mathematician can... Um, can make that model for you if you need it. Um, <laughs> or, or geophysicists, they love doing things like this, but <laughs> I'm not really that person. Excellent. All right, let's move on to um, Troy Belding. He asks, if your father wants to do more videos like this, how about teaching him how to do them themselves, himself? That way he can continue to put up together educational records while you are in Dubai. Thanks for the work. <laughs> what do you think about that suggestion? Uh, I think I, I, I prefer to work with my son. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably good at geology, but, you know, all this thing about filming and editing and stuff like that, I, I better leave that to professionals. <laughs> Let me do the geology. Yeah. As a professional, do the video work and the editing. Yeah, um, I'll be your editor. Um, so if you ever have any ideas for videos, then uh, just tell me about it and I'll edit them. Yeah, good, good. Good stuff. Next up, System asks, these guys are amazing. I agree. Uh, it wants to meet the sea. Why can't they dig a tunnel under the roads so it can get to the sea with minimal damage? This is nature at her creative. Continuing with building walls will take away the hills and the natural environment. This is a question on our um, video where the, the wall was still there. He's suggesting building a tunnel for the lava. Would this be possible? No, it wouldn't be possible. Yeah. Uh, the problem with lava when it's flowing is that it doesn't really behave like water. It always flows the path of least resistance like water does, but lava is uh, much more viscous than water. You can predict that the lava is going to go this way and maybe it starts going that way and then it basically turns and goes another way. And that has mm. to do with the output from the crater. It's also got to do with uh, the cooling of the lava. You see, if you want to visualize how lava does flow, 
it would be perhaps easier to visualize it as a wax flowing from a big candle, a candle that produces lots of uh, wax. And you will see that the flow from the candle will not kind of follow a single path. It will change the course. And in the end, you will, you will have wax flowing in all directions from the candle. And, and this is the same with, with lava. You, you can project a tunnel because you think that the lava is going to go that way. But then a lava flow builds up uh, some kind of obstacle to the flow that's coming from behind, and that will choose a different path, and it's not possible. You cannot really tame a lava flow like you tame a river. The lava flow, once the lava flow flows into a basin or it flows into a channel, it will change the configuration of that basin and that channel, and it will create its own landscape. Mm. Lance Kaz asks, a question for geologist Oliver Inkolfsson. Has the chemical composition of the emerging lava changed? The lava spilling out now, 2nd of June, seems runnier than, than it has been before. When it cools, is it leaving a smoother surface than before? That's a really good question. Uh, the thing is that the chemical composition of the lava isn't constant. It does change. The geochemists, they, they really see this in, in kind of the weight percentages of the different components of the lava. Why this happens is something we, 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 we can discuss. It is possible that there are some changes in the composition of the of the magma in the source, basically at 17 plus kilometers depth. Also what happens is that when the magma is traveling up through the channel, through the pipe towards the crater, it interacts with the uh, Earth's crust. So there's a certain amount of melting going on and, and a mixing in of maybe some crustal material which can affect the composition of the magma when it comes to the, to the crater and starts flowing. And uh, basically the answer to the question is that it is correct that the, the chemical composition of the magma changes somewhat, not a lot. It's always a, it's basaltic, it's a very low in, in silicium, it's rich in iron, it's rich in uh, magnesium. There are changes, and but I think that the rate of flow as it is observed on the surface or coming out of the crater, I think that's more dependent on other things. Mm. like the temperature, like the gradient um, down which the, the, the lava is flowing and so on. So I don't think the chemical composition really affects these physical properties mm. to any large degree. But there are changes and the composition is not entirely constant. So the surface might look uh, slightly different depending on where. Is that an accurate assumption? Well, what we have seen in this eruption, which is very interesting, is that it produces both what we call pahoehoe lava, which are these very, very smooth uh, surfaces, ropey lavas. And it also produces these AA lavas, which are very, very rough. And that has to do with the thickness of the crust that forms on top of the flowing uh, uh, lava body, how it breaks up. There are a number of factors that come into play, which probably have greater um, effect on the appearance of the lava than the chemical composition mm. or, or these relatively minor ch changes in the chemical composition of the, mm. of the source magma. Let's move on to Kim Lambert. She asks, can you please tell us about the multicolored lava coming out of the volcano? What elements determine the colors? I have seen videos showing pink, blue, silver, and green lava also. White in some places as well. I would love to know more about this. The temperature of the lava as it is molten, it basically decides the, the color as you see it. So when you have really hot lava, which is in the order of maybe 11 or even 1200 degrees C, mm. it's glowing, it's yellow. When it gets up somewhat cooler, it starts to darken to a red and even quite dark colors. As the lava flows and it starts to uh, consolidate, the, the colors that you see, you sometimes see a kind of a grayish or even silvery uh, appearance. And these might be due to uh, a certain degree of precipitates on the lava, titanium oxides and other precipitates that can form, giving a grayish color. Hmm. But it can also be 
when the surface is rapidly cooled, it gets kind of a glassy. Mm. So it's a volcanic glass, really. And the volcanic glass, it can, it, it, it's usually rather dark, but it can reflect light depending on the angle at which you look. Mm. This can give the lava a somewhat different nuances of color. Wow. But in reality, the, the basaltic lava flows, they are always dark. Mm. They, are, they, are, they are grayish, they are dark. I've seen all these different hues myself, and it's very, very nice to look at. Well, it's a little bit like, you know, you look at a quiet lake in the evening, or you, or you look at the Mediterranean, and you think it's blue. Yeah. But of course, it's not blue. Yeah. It's uh, transparent. It's an optical illusion, really. It has to do with how the water breaks the, the uh, rays from the sun. Mm -hmm. and how these rays are dispersed through the water and short waves, they disperse more, they scatter more. And so they are in the blue. That's why the sky is blue. That's why the lakes are blue. It's an optical thing. Moving on to the next question. Das Das asks, is the lava hot? <laughs> oh, yes. It's very hot. It's extremely hot. Like I've been saying, it's... Uh, 1100 degrees maybe when it leaves the crater as it is flowing it's still above 1000 degrees c then, then it starts to basically slow down and cool but yes the lava is very hot and it, it can be crushed over but below maybe a 10 or 20 or 30 centimeter crust mm -hmm. you may still have glowing lava and you could see that in some of your videos and it's mm -hmm. it's extremely hot it's yeah. very very hot yeah, absolutely. It's a very interesting feeling to stand close to it. Um, it to me, it always feels like, you know, like rays from the sun hitting me almost. It's it, yes. very hot. It, it, gives, it, it gives off a strong radiating warmth. Yeah, good answer to a very simple question. Um, I like that question actually, because <laughs> we take it we we take it for granted that lava is hot. But having someone just ask, "Is the lava hot?" I like that. Moving on to the next one. I guess you pronounce this name Jorge Biche. This is amazing. I am a new follower. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I do have a question to your dad. I know it is very challenging to predict, but do we have a timeline of how long the eruption may last? I want to go to Iceland to see this. This is a very good question. And this is a question that all of us here and uh, the volcanologists, we, we, are, we, are, we are thinking about. We know that the lava is coming from deep, so it's not coming from a magma chamber that will empty. Mm -hmm. It's coming from the mantle, where in theory there's a almost infinite uh, supply of molten lava to come out. It's been going on now for a little over four months. It's been mm -hmm. four months and one week now. Yeah. We are talking on the 25th of July. It started on the third, 19th of March. For the first three months or so, the lava production, it started with a lava production of about five to six uh, cubic meters per second. Then it increased to about 12 cubic meters per second and continued like that for um, over a, for about a couple of months. But over the past month or so, it has been decreasing somewhat. Now the production is somewhere in the order of about seven cubic meters per second. So it seems that the lava flow is, or the eruption is going down. Yeah. How long will it go on? A colleague of mine answered this question for Iceland radio or television uh, just the other day. And he predicted that the volcano was, or this eruption was entering its kind of final stages. Oh, wow. and he said this might go on a few more weeks or maybe a couple of months. Oh, wow. That's news to me. We never know, right? <laughs> it's difficult to say. Yeah. We know from other eruptions in Iceland, we know this from MIVA um, from the late 1970s and early 1980s. We know this also from the Surtsey eruption in 1963 to 67, that these were eruptions that lasted for a few years. Mm. But they were not continuous. There was maybe a vigorous eruption for a few days or a few weeks or even a few months. And then there was a lull, there was a break, 
and nothing happened, or maybe they were opened up another crater. And mm. we know for, that these sealed volcano eruptions, and this is in a sense a sealed volcano that's forming at Keldigatale, they can last for years. They can mm. even last for tens of years. Mm. But we are not really familiar with the system, how it's going to behave. Maybe this Keltingatal eruption will uh, slow down and quit in a few weeks or maybe a couple of months. And then maybe we might have another eruption in the same system starting yeah. a year later. This is very difficult to say. This question is really a million dollar question. I, yeah, that's I, I, true. I, wish, I, had, I wish I had an answer to it. It yeah. would be very nice, but we don't. So, you know, if we base this on the measurements that we are doing, the the there are there are big lulls in the eruption now. Nothing. There seems to be very little lava production going on for maybe ten hours, twelve hours, and then it goes up again and it can be quite vigorous, up to ten cubic meters per second, and then it kind of slows down and ebbs away and takes a break for a few hours or a couple of days, and then it starts again. Mm-hmm. So all the signs now are that. The eruption from this crater in Keltingatale, it seems to be waning. So everybody who's hoping to book tickets to go see it before uh, before it stops, you better get on that soon. Now's a good time to go. As the eruption is ongoing, if, and if you really want to see this eruption, you should hurry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> time clock is ticking. The gas production figures seem amazing. How is quantifying them achieved? asks uh, Umvu. Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, we don't really have a gas meter, cannot measure it directly, but we have a fairly good idea about the composition of basaltic magma. What is the volume of gases versus the volume of lava? And so what we do is that we can measure very accurately the volume of lava that's produced based on what we know about the volume composition of bas- basaltic magma, we just calculate the volume of the gases. Mm. What we can measure is the composition of the gases. Mm. So we have gas meters stationed that take samples, and these samples are analyzed for different types of gases that come. And then the amount of the different types of gases is also calculated based on uh, geochemistry. Mm. So we, we don't really measure the gas flow, we calculate it, and it's all uh, tied to the volume of lava that's being produced over time. Marco Taverna, I hope I say that correct. Um, Hi, this was a very interesting video. I have a question for Mr. Geologist Oliver Rinkelson. As he says, uh, the magma seems to come from the mantle. But even if it doesn't, what I think is we have lava coming from downstairs. Uh, So I think that somehow the flow should produce a hollow somewhere inside the earth. Is there an evidence of a sinking flow someplace in the world or there will be hollows inside somewhere? As English is not my native language, I hope my question was clear enough. Thanks. Greeting from Italy. Okay, Italy. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. You know, if we, if we have an eruption which is fed by magma coming from a magma chamber, mm. like we have in a big central volcano, uh, once we empty that chamber, if it's not a very deep, I mean, if this magma chamber is at, let's say, three, four, five kilometers depth, what can happen is that then we have a void. We have a... And that will fill in because... Mm. Uh, the volcano will kind of subside into the mm. magma chamber. Right. And we have this in many places. We have this in Iceland, in, in, in Aska. Mm-hmm. We have this also, this has also been happening in uh, in Bardarbunga, mm. where we had a big eruption in uh, 2014, the Holofren eruption. We, we, we see that the, that the mountain is kind of <laughs> sucking into the magma chamber that has, to a certain degree, been emptied. Mm. But with this eruption, there is no magma chamber. Mm. There is The magma is coming from very, very deep. Even though we siphon off, like we have done until today, about 100 million cubic meters of lava, it's not big enough to make any denture. 
Mm. So the crust will not sink in because of this. This is still a very small eruption. Yeah. The total I, volume of lava that's come out of this eruption is now in the order of about 100 million cubic meters. Mm. That's one tenth of a cubic kilometer. And in order to call this a big eruption, we would, per definition, it would have to produce at least one cubic kilometer of lava. Mm. But we've so far only produced about one tenth of that. Mm -hmm. And if this lava flow continues for maybe four years, then we can classify it as a large eruption, but we are not there yet. And even if we had a large eruption, we maybe we could we could detect some sinking in of the crust mm -hmm. with uh, high precision uh, GPS uh, measurements and, 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 and gravity uh, measurements, but it wouldn't it wouldn't make a a hollow or anything mm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said before that the mantle is practically infinite, and just imagining the size of the planet. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine that it makes a significant impact <laughs> when it, it, it certainly doesn't yeah. no. mega skills nine asks also when it rains through the clouds of sulfur dioxide it makes acid rain literally sulfuric acid uh, that's what it's like on venus although 800 degrees fahrenheit i guess this 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 is not a question it's just uh, my own curiosity i wanted to ask you is is he correct yes in, yes in a sense he is uh the, the, the sulfur dioxide, if it's in high concentration, it will produce acid rain mm. if it rains through it or if it, when it mixes with water vapor and, and it rains, yes, absolutely. Oh, uh, and, then I have a question about what if the, when the lava reaches the ocean then, doesn't that mean that we're going to get a lot of, you said mixes with water vapor, would that result in a lot of sulfur dioxide? No, no, not really, because okay. most because most of the sulfur dioxide has already left the the lava before it con because the degassing occurs right okay in or below the crater. So mm. most of the carbon the, the the sulfur dioxide will have left the lava. So basically, what will happen if the lava flow reaches the ocean is that. Uh, the immediate waters close will boil and there will be a lot of water vapor, not so mm. much gas release at all. Mm. But in a, in, in a very, very large eruptions like the um, Laki eruption in 1783 in Iceland, which was one of the biggest eruptions during historical time anywhere on Earth, which produced maybe in the order of about 15 cubic kilometers of lava. Uh, That's a lot. <laughs> there, was a, there was a very, very serious uh, volcanic pollution. Mm. And this is exactly what happened. There was, there was acid rain falling, not only in Iceland. There was a volcanic haze across most of northern and northwestern Europe and the British Isles and Iceland. And this po posed a very, very serious uh, health threat to people living there at the time. Mm. And there were numerous reports of people dying from lung diseases because mm. of uh, they were basically breathing in these sulfuric vapors, which then destroyed their lungs. So th this is something which is which is known from very large eruption, but this mm. eruption is a small eruption. Right. Yeah. But even the volcanic pollution from this eruption can cause inconvenience for people with asthma, with people mm. with uh, call and with uh, lung diseases. So the Meet Meteorological Office in Iceland, they, they make predictions as to the wind direction and the, the risk for uh, volcanic pollution over the urban areas around the mm. volcano. And sometimes there have been recommendations to people to with weak lungs not to go outdoors and, you know, not let your children sleep outdoors in, a, in the carriages and so on. Mm. And even though this is a small uh, eruption, the uh, sulfur dioxide production of this um, eruption is still in the order of about four or five thousand tons per day. There's a lot, lots of gas release, but yeah. 
it's not enough to have any really significant effect uh, as yet. I don't know how to say this name. RP, FPS, FPV, sorry. Um, as always, an amazing video with your geologist dad. Thank you so much. Is there any conclusion and learnings from studying that new volcano already? Could your dad say something about that? I guess it's a very open-ended question. Of course, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. Mm. And yes, definitely. So, so the, the geological setting of this volcano or, or of this eruption, it's basically at the boundary between the two big plates, the North American and the Eurasian plates. The, the, the volcanic field of Reykjanes has been inactive, or it's not been active for now for about 800 years. This is the first eruption there, which we are able to monitor. We, we are on a learning curve. We are learning about the nature of the systems. We know that the, these eruptions, they are cyclic. So there was a, an episode with lots of eruption where, where where five out of the six volcanic systems of Reagan has erupted between the 10th and the early 14th centuries. Uh, over a period of about 300 years, they all erupted. Then it's been quiet for 800 years. And now it's, is this a start of a new volcanic and a rift episode that may last for tens of years and, or even hundreds of years? We don't know. So mm. what we have, so, so what my colleagues have been doing, they have been putting up networks with all kinds of measurements, GPS measurements, all kinds of seismic surveys to basically learn how this eruption affects the other volcanic systems. So we, we are on a steep learning curve here. And I think it's too early to say we've learned this and this and this and this, but still we have learned quite a lot. Wow. I think one of the very the important observations that we have done is that this is a magma that comes from very, very deep. Even magma coming from this depth and through a relatively limited channel or a feeding pipe, it can last for a long time. This is something which we need to take into consideration. We will evaluate all kinds of things in light of what we learned from this volcano. We have, we have, we have a town which is very close to this Grindavik. Mm -hmm. We have power plants, which are very close. We have the famous Blue Lagoon, which is in effect situated right on top of, an, of, a, of a volcanic system. We yeah. need to think about these things. Uh, what if this eruption is just the first eruption in a series of volcanic events or eruptions that are going to occur on these different systems? Yes, we are trying to learn as much as we can, but I think we are still pretty much in the phase of collecting data and analyzing data. More and more, we will be getting into the, into the uh, phase of drawing conclusions and making synthesis. And that, th so that's when we, we are really going to start. We're going to come out with some major new findings from this eruption. We are not really there yet, maybe. Well, that sounds like a very high note to end this at. The, the image of all these volcanoes potentially erupting is uh, it's exciting and terrifying at the same time. I guess the last question here is from um, William West. Does the lava that has already erupted remelt due to the heat of new lava? It looks like it could, but I don't know for sure. No, it does not remelt to any degree. Mm. It's, a, it's a basic question of entropy and energy. Mm -hmm. So once it has cooled, if it comes into, into contact with molten lava, it will, quite the opposite, have the effect of cooling the molten lava. Mm -hmm. but the molten lava will not manage to reheat earlier flow to the extent that it starts to flow again. I mean, that may happen a little bit spot-wise, mm -hmm. right at the contact, but right. uh, you, you cannot really remelt a lava that's already uh, cooled and consolidated. Yeah, it is. A, it is a good question. I feel because uh, some of the clips that I captured, people comment that it looks like lasagna or like cheese, and cheese. I think you can remelt it a lot. I mean, I guess not infinitely, but you can remelt it a lot. So, I guess that concludes I mean, I, that lava. I think is, you will find. Like I think you will find my son that cheese is very different from basaltic lava pops. <laughs> 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 <Dang>. <laughs> I have read 
many of these questions that have been posed. I think these questions are good, all of them. I've tried mm-hmm. to answer questions to the degree that that I have been able to, and you know, I would encourage people to read these uh, questions and answers. And I think it's it's great that people are curious. And I think one of the things that is important is that there is no such a thing as a stupid question. If you don't know something, you want to know about it, that's a good question. Even though some might think it's very basic or it's a simple question, it, it's not. It's not. You have a question, you want to have an answer, and I think that's it's very good if you your in your TV channel that you can you can basically provide answers to questions that people have. Yeah, I mean, thanks to your help, um, I I'm, don't know anything about lava, but I well, you know well, I, I represent that. my audience. <laughs> You have been on a steep learning course with Oh, me. that's true, yeah. I have been learning a lot with you. For sure. I think you know much more than, than most people nowadays. It's, it's true. I've, I'm actually, I've uh, gone to the comments and answered a few questions myself. So <laughs> I guess, yeah, I'm getting there. I think that, uh, that marks a very nice spot to end this video. Thank you so much for um, taking the time today to chat, even though, you know, we're uh, time zones apart. Um, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to do this video with you, Dad, <laughs> Papa. <laughs> and so we, 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 we'll see if the mm. eruption continues. We might come back with a new video. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm hoping to come to Iceland in September. It might have stopped by then. It might not have. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Thanks again. And everybody watching at home, uh, thank you for watching all the way to the end. Um, If you did like the video, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. And uh, we will have more volcano content coming out. Um, I'm also making some travel vlogs in Iceland. And right now I'm living in Dubai. So there's going to be stuff from Dubai as well. So hopefully you can look forward to that. Um, Yeah. Thank you. And uh, bye-bye for now. Take care.